Okay, everybody, welcome. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord God, our Father, we praise and thank you for the gift of the Paschal Mystery and for the gift of the, the sacred time of the sacred Paschal tri Triduum that we enter into tonight. Help us to understand more profoundly our need for salvation and be very grateful for the gift you've given us through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So this is Easter Sunday. And the gospel is already always from the gospel according to John. So on the first day of the week, so remember um, on the Sabbath, you know, the Lord, when he, when he created the, everything, he rested on the Sabbath, the, the last day of the week, Saturday. So this is the first day of the week. So it must have been the most horrible Sabbath for, uh, for, these pe for, for Jesus' disciples. And of course, John, John says that Passover and Sabbath were celebrated at the same time. So the earliest that anybody could do anything would be once that's over. Uh, and so uh, it's really interesting, on the first day of the week, and, and so, you know, this then, one of the things as, as, as Christians we look, this is the eighth day of the week, or the first day of the new creation, the first day of the new creation. Mary of Magdala, who was at, and John clearly has Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, along with the mother of God and the beloved disciple, came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Now, always remember that, that John never mentioned anything, it's just, you know, just say, oh yeah, it's just dark. It, it is dark because, it's dark because she, she's devastated by grief, you know, and, and don't forget when, when Nicodemus came to Jesus earlier in the gospel, he came at night when it was dark because he didn't want the rest of the Sanhedrin to know that he's with Jesus. Or when Judas betrayed Jesus, he left and it says, at, it says and John says specifically, and it was dark. And then John, imme Jesus immediately says, now am I to be glorified? So this darkness isn't just the, the lack of light, it's the lack of faith the lack of hope, and, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she was going back, and so many times in grief, we just don't pay attention to details. You know, she didn't, you know, again, this is my, what I think, but she didn't even think of, oh, who's gonna move that heavy stone? You know, she's in grief. So she ran and went to Simon Peter. So she went to anoint the body. And when she saw the stone removed, she thought, oh my gosh, they've stolen the body. In fact, that's, that's what she says later in the day, you know, when, when she mistakes Jesus for the gardener. There's a lot of running on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. She ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, you know, so this is Simon Peter, the beloved disciple. They've taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So, you know, that's what she thinks, you know, you know, it's none of this resurrection stuff. She's still in dark. You know, they've stolen his body. You know, and, and uh, stealing bodies, uh, unfortunately, was kind of a common custom in those times. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran. Again, a lot of running. But the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. You know, when Father Terry was here, uh, I always said, he's the other disciple, I'm Peter. I'm in charge, he's not. I, he, he's faster than I am, he's, I'm slower. But what he does, he bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. So he was deferring, he was deferring to Peter's status as, you know, Jesus clearly made Peter the head of the disciples. And he looked in and he saw the burial cloths. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths that had rolled up in a separate place. So he saw the evidence. And so what, what this is doing, there's really three things that are going on here. First of all, you know, it, it says the body was not stolen. Thieves wouldn't unwrap the body and leave the, wrap, the cloth there. Second, something is unprecedented here. You know, Lazarus came out bound with burial bands. Something different is here. And then there had been a conscious, deliberate action. So then the other, and, and so 
So Peter goes, and don't forget, Peter is still in the darkness of his guilt from denying Jesus in the courtyard. So he's got his darkness that doesn't allow him to understand. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at him for, for, first, and he saw and believed. So he's beginning to believe. So, you know, the last time Peter saw Jesus was when the cock crowed. The last time John, the beloved disciple, saw Jesus, he saw his dead body. So there's still a bit of darkness here, you know, but he's beginning to put things together. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. You know, and later that day, when Jesus, when, when Jesus walks through the, the, the locked doors, that's when they begin to believe. You know, so, you know, an empty tomb isn't good enough. It's their personal encounter with the risen Lord that convinces them of the resurrection. And the same is true of Mary Magdalene. You know, it, it isn't until she encounters the risen Lord. Um, so at, at the beginning, um, the darkness, yes, it represents their state of mind. Darkness also symbolizes sin, betrayal, doubt, sadness, fear, and ignorance. So that's, in, in general, in the, Old, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that's what darkness symbolize, symbolizes. But there are a couple of things I encountered this year in essays that I was reading that I hadn't really thought of before. In an essay from uh, Bishop Barron, he likened the darkness to creation before God said, let there be light. And so what are we waiting for at that point but Jesus himself, who is the light of the world, his resurrection. So those were two things I hadn't really thought about before, but that was very, um, to me, very interesting. And that's the great thing about John's gospel. There's many, many different depths of meaning. Absolutely. Um, now, where they said um, the stone, so the stone was first of all very practical because it would keep out grave robbers unless there were a number of them and they were very strong so they could roll it away. It also kept out animals, but in, in a whole other level, the stone represents the finality of death too. So that, that barrier between the living and the dead, that stone represents that. And the stone has already been removed when Mary arrives, so that that hint that the barrier between life and death has already been removed, I think that's another, all these little clues that John leaves too is just fascinating. Um, when Mary says, we don't know where they put him, that's an echo from Matthew's gospel where um, the, the Jewish authorities go to Caesar or to Pilate and say, hey, you know, they're, they keep talking about he's going to come back. Let's put a guard on the tomb. So that's just that echo from Matthew's gospel that there was supposed to be a guard on the tomb so that the disciples couldn't come and steal the body and pretend like he'd been resurrected. So that's just another, you know, another one of those proofs that we have to look at when we look at everything in the totality um, of what we're given. Um, and they both ran, Peter and the beloved disciple. That indicates the urgency that they were feeling. And we often call the tomb empty. We often refer to the empty tomb. The tomb is not empty. Jesus' body isn't there, but there are so many hints, so many clues that this is not like Lazarus's resuscitation. This is something new and different. This, the the evidence is there if there were grave robbers. They certainly would not have taken the time to leave the cloths behind. There, there's a beautiful essay by St. John Chrysostom that talks all, talks all about grave robbers and why this would not have happened. Um, why would they rob? I mean, what was the purpose? What were they using? Anything that was valuable on yeah. the body. Jewels, clothing. Um, the linen cloths that they were buried in were often woven in a single piece, so those were um, expensive and, and worth a lot. Uh, so that's, and then any jewelry, any spices, anything that may have been left with the body, the grave robbers would go in and take that. So, so it's yeah. kind of a ghoulish thing. <laughs> it, it really was, but 
You had to be a real creep to be a grave robber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not something you'd want to put on your resume. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so something else that I encountered here, um, the the evidence that is in the tomb is clearly shows the action of God the Father, that that God. If you look at the words that are used, rolled up, um, co- that had covered his head, they're, they're very passive voice here in what's written, indicating that God's action is what was most crucial here, that, that God was the agent, and Jesus didn't need to be untied the way Lazarus did. He's not in the tomb because God acted. And Christ now has an immortal, glorified existence that transcends everything earthly. Um, And one other thing I got out of Bishop Barron's essay, too, is the idea that in the prophet Ezekiel, in the the dry bones, um, we talk about that passage over and over again, where God says through the prophet Ezekiel to the people, oh, my people, I will open your graves and raise you up. This is the fulfillment, according to Baron, (laughs) a fulfillment of that prophecy. That, you know, here is God, God is acting, enacting the words that he said through the prophet Ezekiel. Um, and then um, two other things that I got from Barron, so I don't have to read that. Um, that John's reaction, John running faster, we often assume that's because he's younger. <laughs> but that's what Father Terry said. That's what Father Terry always said. But one of the things I got out of Barron's essay, too, is that because of his position as the beloved disciple, which again invites us into that role. The love that he had for Christ and the love that Christ had for him sped his feet. It sped him on his way. So love made him faster, too, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. And then um, we always have to keep in mind that resurrection is the heart of our faith. It's not certainly the passion is crucial to get to the resurrection but the resurrection is the heart of our faith and and paul saint paul tells us if jesus wasn't resurrected our faith is in vain so resurrection is really that's the heart of it and then when they said he saw and believed that word is really as father said better translated began to believe and then when when they encounter the person of the risen Christ, that cements their belief and gives them the courage and the strength to go out and evangelize. Uh, always on Easter Sunday, we have one of uh, Peter's sermons uh, from the Acts of the Apostles. And it really is, uh, what it is, is just, it's, it's a, a capsule form of what we believe. So remember that the Gospel of Luke goes from Galilee to Jerusalem, the Acts of the Apostles from Jerusalem to Rome. And it's the record of the church's growth through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's Peter. He's gone to Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a pagan. Peter, as a faithful Jew, shouldn't really be there. And Peter's already had this vision where God has this tarp and sends down all kinds of unclean animals and says, okay, go ahead and eat it. So Peter's beginning to understand that, 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 that the gospel is for everybody going beyond the Jewish matrix. So Peter proceeded to speak and said, you know what has happened all over Judea. So this is in, in, in uh, Cornelius' house. Beginning, he's, he's pretty much saying this is what's happened. Beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Remember that anointing, you know, is, is chrism, Christos. Jesus is the Christos, the Christ, the Messiah. We were witnesses of all that he did. So 
again, a crucial part of our faith is trusting in the witnesses. This is not fake news. <laughs> you know, we believe them, we trust them. You know, we trust that their experience of their encounters with the risen Christ are true, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man, God raised out on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And remember that, that the word apostle means to be sent forth. So he says that's why he called us in the first place, to be witnesses, you know, to trust that this is really true. You know, and, and also, not only, you know, did, they, did, did all these people, you know, put their, they died because they believed in this. Not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So in other words, you know, it was the transformed body of Jesus. It wasn't some spirit. It was the real Jesus transformed. He commissioned us to preach to the people. So that's the end of the Gospels. Go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Peter kind of waffles on that. Paul, Paul, Paul really pushes him. And testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness. So he's the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament and the scriptures that we cherish, that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Um, so the vision that Father talked about, that's in, that's literally just a few verses before this. It's, it's in chapter 10, but it's verse 11. And then in verse 28, um, it's, is expressed this radical break with tradition. It's bad enough that Peter has this vision that he's like literally made him physically ill to even think about to eat all these unclean animals. But then in, chap in verse 28, it says that we should not call any person common or unclean. So this is just this radical break with Jewish tradition. And it's, it's really, really hard for him. Um, and immediately before this passage in, in uh, verse 34, the second half of verse 34, it says, in truth, I see that God shows no partiality. In other words, he's not picking and choosing between Jews and Gentiles. Everyone is invited to um, reap the fruits of the resurrection, to be part of this new movement. Um, Luke sees Peter's conversion about the Gentiles very much as a parallel to Paul's conversion um, experience altogether on the road to Damascus. Paul was like, it was an immediate, he gets knocked off his horse as we, as we envision it. He wasn't really on a horse. That's beside the point. But that's what the artists say. But that's what the artists <laughs> always depict, especially Caravaggio. It's yeah. a beautiful painting. But um, he gets, he literally gets knocked and, and, and has this tremendous conversion. And this is Peter's conversion to understand that this is a new paradigm. It's a new way of looking at things, a new way of understanding things. And Peter's audience here in the house of Cornelius reminds us that this resurrection is for everyone. It's not just for the Jews. Yes, salvation comes from the Jews, as Jesus tells us, but resurrection is for all people. Um, and at the end here, that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name, that's God's will, not human action. That is God's will active in the world. And immediately after this passage, we're told that the Holy Spirit descends upon the household, the entire household, not just the Jews that were present, but everyone. Again, that reinforces the conclusion that salvation is for everyone. Uh, we pray Psalm 118. We pray that at the Easter Vigil, too. It's one of the first Psalms, you know, to be attributed to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a song of thanks. Um, you have, we have two choices for the New Testament. We're doing Colossians this year. Oh, we are? Oh. Yeah. 
I didn't prepare Colossians because Corinthians was in the bulletin. Oh. I assumed they had the right one. Okay. <laughs> well, then, never mind. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, you well. can't believe everything that's in the bulletin. That's for sure. <laughs> so, Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ, what he really means is you were co-raised with Christ. And he means... Uh, I'm, uh, it's my fault, so if you want to blame me, no, 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 no problem. Because I want to emphasize baptism. Sure. You know, and, and Colossians emphasizes baptisms. Uh, so does Corinthians, really. But Corinthians talks about throwing out the old leaven, mm -hmm. you know, getting rid of, of whatever, you know, whatever in, infiltrates us so that we can be one with Christ. Well, when, when, we're, when, when we're baptized, we are raised, co-raised with Christ. He says, so seek what is above. Seek your union with Jesus Christ. That's what he really means. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's Psalm 110. So, you know, Christ has ascended. So he's not only talking about the, the resurrection, but he's talking also about the ascension. So Christ may, may not be bodily present, but we are his body. And we're co-raised when we're baptized. So think of what is above, not of what is on earth. Think of your status with Christ. For you have died, you know, and, and we'll see that in the letter to the Romans on, on, at the Easter Vigil. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. That's why I'm so, I push people as much as possible to do baptism by immersion. Because it, you know, it's so, that's what baptism is about. When Christ your life appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. You know, that promise, you know, of, of doing that. And if you've ever been to a funeral where Father Bill has preached, you have heard him liken baptism over and over again to um, our first death, the first time we die, is we die to ourselves, we die to our own um, earthly desires, our own worldly um, immersion, and we are immersed in the mercy of God the Father, the mercy of Christ, and we are raised up again into a new life. You know, baptism is one of those um, sacraments that leaves an indelible mark upon our souls. We are branded, if you will, for lack of a better term, but we are marked, we are identified as belonging to God the Father, to um, Christ and to the Holy Spirit, and our lives are no longer our own. St. Paul talks about this over and over again, that we live through Christ and Christ lives within us and, and we are no longer living for ourselves alone. And this portion of Colossians is so beautiful because it stre stresses this over and over again. And it's, you know, seek not what is of this earth, but seek what is above. We talk about that over and over here in Bible study, right? We talk about the earth. This is, this is our temporary home. This isn't our destiny. Our destiny is to live in heaven. That's our hope. And if you're like me, you're, you're hoping for purgatory along the way. Yeah, so, yeah I'm aiming for that. <laughs> it's not that I'm not aiming for heaven, but I know I'm not going to make it the first time around. I'm hoping for the rebound, right? We're hoping for purgatory so we get there eventually and everything that keeps us from being the person we should be will be burned away in purgatory from God's love but that whole idea of, of our life is hidden um, with Christ our desires every time we subsume what we want and act for the good of others we're allowing our lives to be hidden and the life that Christ gives us in baptism, we're allowing that to be, to shine through. And remember when we depict the saints in art, they're always depicted with the halos, right? What's the reason for that? Well, the reason for that is that they have nothing that separates them from the love of God. And the love of God is so powerful and so beautiful, it just shines straight through them. That's why they're pictured with halos. That's what... Paul is talking about here is that we can allow that love to shine through us and every time we do that we keep our baptismal promises which most of us <laughs> as infants and don't remember which is why we renew our baptismal promises throughout the Easter season yes ma'am so 
it's it's not a biblical concept. Mm -mm. So oh. the idea of purifying is biblical. Mm -hmm. Her question was, why isn't purgatory mm. mentioned? The idea of purification is, and that's the essence of, of what we call purgatory. It's a Latin word, means purify. So that if there's anything that separates me from the love of God and of other people, there's the purifying love of God that burns that away. You know, that's what that's where that is. And the reason it's not mentioned in the Bible is because it's it's a concept that has developed in the church. Um, that's one of the great things about the church is it's organic. It's always growing. It's always changing. Um, and that's one of the things that we have learned over the years. If you, it, we realize it's just simply logical. God's, Father Dan always used to say, God's mercy is always just and his justice is always merciful. And to me, that encapsulates the idea of purgatory. Um, if you don't, for whatever reason, if, you don't, if we don't die in a state of grace, but we've lived a good life, it doesn't make sense that a God who is just and merciful would say, okay, well, you have one venial sin on your soul, so you're going straight to hell. That doesn't make sense. So if we, if we allow, theologically, if we think about the God that, that we know, that's not something that he would want. And he, remember, too, you know, we, we, we're a church of both uh, scripture and tradition. So the, the development from scripture of this idea. And I've got an appointment, so I'll see you. All right. <laughs> and don't forget, if you want to say anything about the uh, sequence, it's great. Oh. So anyway, happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> I'm always late for something, but. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, that's true. I stopped into the office yesterday but couldn't find my file um, on the sequence. There are four sequences that still remain in the church. Um, there used to be hundreds. They were things that, medieval poems that were written that have crept, that crept into the liturgy and they were used as an extension of the Alleluia before the gospel. And these beautiful Latin poems that were written, hundreds of them ended up. Well, in the reform of the liturgy, most of them were stripped out and the liturgy was streamlined to make it more what was initially intended. So a lot of these were just stripped out. We have four that are still accepted and in use in the church. Um, one is the Stabat Mater, which we sing at Stations of the Cross, right? So that, that's one of the sequences. A second sequence is this Sunday's the Easter sequence, Victime Pascale Lauda, Laudas, which means um, to the Paschal Lamb give praise. And so after the second reading, we'll go into a singing of the Easter sequence. It's very short, and you can look at it in your book. It's on page 154. Remember, it was written in Latin, so the translation from Latin into English is a little clunky sometimes. If you see the Latin text, you see the, the rhyme and the meter better. But just remember, it's, it's now in English, so it's, it's a little clunkier. The third sequence we use is the Pentecost sequence, which when we get to Pentecost Sunday, you'll see that one as well. That's another one you really have to see. And I will have it by then, I promise. I'll, I'll find it somehow or other, somewhere. Um, and I, I have it where the Latin and the English are side by side. You can really see the poetry in, in the Latin. And they, the Pentecost sequence, I think they do a little bit better job in, in keeping the, the rhyme and the meter. And then the fourth sequence we use is actually, we don't use it here at St. Pius. I will tell you, there are some churches that do. It's part of the Feast of Corpus Christi or the Body and Blood of Christ. It was written by St. Thomas Aquinas. If, if you look in your book on page 154, it's like a couple of paragraphs long. It's not really huge, just a little sequence. If you turn to, where is Body and Blood of Christ is right after the Easter season. So we have Trinity Sunday and then we have Corpus Christi. 
If you look on page 199, you will see the sequence for the body of blood. It's like an entire page. <laughs> it's, that's why we don't use it. It would take 15 minutes just to sing it, to get through it in the mass. It's beautiful. And it's, um, again, it was written in Latin, so you have to see the Latin to really get the, the sense of the, of, um, the, the rhyme scheme. But we don't actually use it. It's an option, but we don't employ it here. So just so you know, don't look ahead at that and go, oh, holy mackerel. No, 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 we don't use that sequence. But there are... Those are the four sequences that are still in use in the church. And we here really only use the Stabat Mater, um, the Easter sequence, and the Pentecost sequence. So that begins the sequences. The other nice thing is, too, the Stabat Mater leads up to the Easter season, and then the sequences begin and end. They bracket, begin and end the Easter season. So that's kind of a nice um, bookend. For the seasons. All right, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> you can go. It's safe now. <laughs> and Father just told me he will not be here next week. He's got an opportunity to go somewhere. So you get you're stuck with me. 